Questions to the Prime Minister, Andrew Bridgen. Question one, Mr Speaker. Office and Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. (laughs) The Right Honourable Gentleman is a notable celebrity, not only in Aylesbury, but here in this House. The Right Honourable Gentleman. Mr Speaker, I have been asked to reply. My right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, is in Northern Ireland, outlining this government's commitment to the people there and our plan to secure a Brexit deal that delivers on the result of the referendum. Mr Speaker, I am sure that the whole House will want to join me in welcoming today's announcement that the next meeting of NATO heads of state and government will take place in London in December 2019. This is fitting, as 70 years ago this year, the United Kingdom, led by those Atlanticist champions Clement Attlee and Ernie Bevin, was one of the Alliance's 12 founding members and London was home to the first NATO headquarters. We will continue to play a key role in NATO as it continues its mission of keeping nearly one billion people safe. Andrew Bridgen. Mr Speaker, I have always considered the uh, Leader of the Opposition to be just an unreconstructed Marxist. However, in light of video footage that's emerged this week, emerged this week I may well have to change that view. He clearly campaigned vigorously against repeated EU referendums in Ireland and declared forcefully that he did not wish to live under a European empire of the 21st century. So in this spirit of cross-party consensus, would my right honourable friend join with the Leader of the Opposition to dismiss once and for all any prospect of a second EU referendum and reaffirm that we are leaving on the 29th of March? Um, Mr Speaker, I can say to to my honourable friend that the Government's position is clear. We, we said to the British people in 2016 that we would accept their vote as decisive, yeah, and the duty yeah. of politicians is to implement the result of the referendum and not to suggest that the public got it wrong and I think undermine trust in democracy. I mean, the Honourable Lady is a notable celebrity, not merely in Islington but here in this House. Emily Thornbury. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am so glad to renew my acquaintance with the Minister for the Cabinet Office, or as the newspapers always call him, effectively the Deputy Prime Minister. Surely the only occasion these days when the words Prime Minister and effective are used in the same sentence. And while there are, there are many other important issues that I would like to discuss with the Cabinet Office Minister today, sadly none is more vital or urgent than Brexit. So I would like to use our time to have a sensible, grown-up discussion about what the actual plan is between now and March the 29th. And to this end, can I ask him this? If the briefing is correct that, this is not, that there will not be a fresh, meaningful vote on the withdrawal agreement next week, and if that's right, when will the vote take place? I, I think that um, my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, was completely clear on this at this dispatch box last week. She said that she, she said that the meaningful vote itself would be brought back as soon as possible, and if it were not possible, if it were not possible to bring the meaningful vote back by the 13th next Wednesday. The government would then make a statement and would then table a motion for debate the next day. Emily Thornbury. I thank the Minister for that answer, Mr Speaker. And I take from that and from other briefings that we've heard um, is that the time for a fresh vote will be after the min- Prime Minister has secured what she called last week a significant and legally binding change to, w- to the withdrawal agreement. So that this House has something genuinely different to vote on. If that is the case, can the Minister simply clarify what will happen if we start to approach March 29th and those significantly legally binding changes have not been achieved? Well, the Prime Minister, I think, has been announced by Number 10, is going to be 
in Brussels tomorrow, where she will be seeing President Juncker, uh, President Tusk and the President of the European Parliament, Mr Tajani, to discuss the changes that she is seeking following the recent votes in this House, both to reject the uh, deal that was on the table and to support the amendment in the name of my right honourable friend, the member for Altrincham and Sale West. I do think that the honourable lady, the right honourable lady, does need, I mean, not just perfectly fairly to question the government, but actually to face up to the fact that if, as both she and I wish, we are to leave the EU in an orderly manner with a deal, it requires this House to vote in favour of a deal and not just declare that it does not want a no deal scenario. Emily Thornbury. Again, I would like to thank the Minister. Um, but does the Prime Minister seriously think that she will get anything different than the responses that we have heard from the EU over recent days? Because none of them have given us any encouragement that they are willing to reopen the withdrawal agreement unless the Prime Minister is willing to reconsider the red lines on which the agreement is based. So does the Minister not agree that the sensible, cautious thing to do at this late stage is to seek a temporary extension of Article 50 so that we have time to see whether the negotiations succeed or, if they do not, to pursue a different plan? It is the, the problem with the uh, proposition that the Right Honourable Lady puts forward is that it would simply defer the need for this House, and including the opposition front bench, to face up to some difficult decisions. Now, the Right Honourable Lady has criticised the approach that my Right Honourable Friend, the Prime Minister, has taken, but I have to put it to her that the Leader of the Opposition, last week, having met the Prime Minister, went out in front of the cameras and demanded changes to the backstop as part of the approach he wanted to see for the future. The Right Honourable Lady has said that she would be comfortable with the backstop. Does she agree with her leader, or is she sticking to her guns on this? I hear what the Minister is saying, but he does not seem to give us any answers. I, I genuinely appreciate his attempts. I hope he will understand the concern that all of us have, not just in this House, but across the country, that we have a government treading water in the Niagara River while the current is taking us over the falls. So can we go... Uh, be quiet. The whip on duty has got no useful contribution to make other than to nod and shake his head in the appropriate places. No chuntering from a sedentary position from the honourable gentleman is required or will persist. Emily Thornbury. I'm very grateful, Mr Speaker. So can we go back to the central issue, which is this. There is no way that we can avoid a border in Ireland after Brexit without a full customs union or a permanent backstop or some new technological solution. So can the Minister tell us which of those options the Government is currently working towards? Well, the the Right Honourable Lady again makes this commitment saying that the Labour Party wants to see a permanent permanent customs union. But um, what most people who support a customs union say they want is to ensure that businesses can expect to export to the EU without tariffs, quotas or rules of origins checks. And that is precisely what the Prime Minister's deal does, but also allows this country to establish trade agreements with other nations around the world. So what part of that deal does the Right Honourable Lady actually object to? If the Honourable Gentleman would like me to answer questions, I would be quite happy to hold a seminar for him at another stage as to what a proper Brexit ought to look like. But may I continue with my job, and perhaps he can continue with his and answer some questions. The technological solution is a non-starter. A permanent backstop will never be acceptable to the ERG or the DUP. And the only solution that will actually work is a full customs union. That is what I said at our first encounter here in 2016. It is the answer that is staring the government in the face. 
If they backed it, it would command a majority in this House. It would avoid the mayhem and the chaos of no deal. And it would project it would protect the jobs at Nissan, Airbus and elsewhere, which are currently at grave risk. So can the Minister explain why the Prime Minister is so dead against it? Well, even, even if we, we take uh, the Right Honourable Lady's uh, a, a somewhat ill-defined description of a permanent customs union, that would not address issues in respect of Northern Ireland and Ireland, Correct. in respect of either uh, regulatory standards for industrial goods or phytosanitary checks for foodstuffs and for livestock. So even in her own terms, her answer is inadequate. Now, she may well then go on to say that she also wants to be part of a single market. And indeed, the Right Honourable Lady has said that she'd be happy with the same place as Norway. But that means free movement continuing, and her party's manifesto explicitly said that free movement would stop. So is the Right Honourable Lady supporting a Norway model, or is she supporting the Labour Party's manifesto? Emily Thornbury! Flattered though I am that the Minister feels it necessary to ask me questions, I do feel that it is important to make it clear that the reason that I have asked these questions today is that the Minister for the Cabinet Office understands Europe, Northern Ireland and Brexit probably better than any of his Cabinet colleagues. So if anyone could give us answers from the Government, it would be him. But the truth is there are no answers. Plan A has been resoundingly rejected by Parliament. Plan B was ruled out by the EU months ago. And the government is in danger of sleepwalking the country towards leaving with no plan and no deal at all. So, with just over 50 days to go, can I give the Minister a final opportunity to tell us whether there is a better plan than this, or for goodness sake, will they let Parliament take charge instead? Mr Speaker, as I said earlier, the Prime Minister will be reporting back to this House next week following her discussions in Brussels and elsewhere. But I have to say to the the Right Honourable Lady, the two-year deadline, the 29th of March deadline, stems from European law and the wording of Article 50, which, which lays down the two years. The Right Honourable, the right honourable Lady, as I recall, voted in favour of triggering Article 50. Now, perhaps it is, perhaps, uh, Mr Speaker, it was one of those votes where she was present but not involved. But I... I have to say to her and to her front bench that if they are worried about no deal, they have to vote for a deal, and every time they vote against a deal, the risk of no deal uh, becomes greater. And it really is time for the opposition front bench for once to put the national interest first, do the right thing, and vote for a deal. Robert Halfon! Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last Friday, the Health Secretary made a superb visit to Princess Alexandra Hospital in Harlow, meeting some inspirational staff doing outstanding work for patients. However, our hospital is crumbling. Sewage is coming into the operating theatres. Our infrastructure is failing. Will my honourable friend lobby uh, the Treasury to ensure we get the capital funding so Harlow gets the new hospital that we desperately need? Um, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I know that my right hon. Friend, the Health Secretary, was very impressed by what he saw on his visit to Harlow. I know my right hon. Friend, the, the member for Harlow, will remain a very ardent champion of the need for renewal of those hospital facilities. He knows that as part of the Government's long-term plan for the NHS, NHS England will be making decisions about its capital investments for the future, and I am sure that my right hon. Friend will be driving his case home with that. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I welcome the Minister to his place. Mr Speaker, whilst the chaos of the UK Government's shambolic Brexit negotiations have dominated the headlines, this Government has sneaked through a cut in pensions credit, which will see some couples up to £7,000 a year 
worse off. Shame. An estimated 300,000 more pensioners are now living in poverty than in 2012. Does the Minister agree that his government needs to change course and, instead of robbing pensioners, start supporting them? Uh, Mr. 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 Speaker, I think the, the right hon. Gentleman is talking about the situation of mixed age couples where, where one is uh, over pensionable age and receiving a pension and the other is of working age. I think that uh, what uh, the Government has done, indeed, what this House voted for some years ago is perfectly logical and in lines with the intention of the benefit system. Yeah. Blackford! Here, here, well, Mr. Here. Speaker, we certainly did not vote for that. What we have seen from this Government is it continues to put the hands into the pockets of the poorest in our society. In fact, it is the Tory government that is allowing a proposal to take free TV licences away from pensioners. It is this Conservative government that is denying women born in the 1950s their full rights to state pensions. And it is this Tory government that provides, presides over the lowest state pension age in any developed country. Quite shameful. Pensioners' poverty is not a myth, it is a reality. Mr Speaker, with Scottish pensioners being shortchanged by the UK Government, the the Minister must agree that the only way to end pensioner poverty in Scotland is to put fairness back into our pension system and to give older people the dignity that they deserve in retirement. It is for pension reform to be taken by the Scottish Government in an independent Scotland. Mr. Mr. Speaker, the the right honourable gentleman's got some nerve here. He knows. He knows. He knows that it is in the power of the Scottish Government under devolution legislation to top up social security benefits if they choose to do so. He knows. He knows, Mr. Speaker. Oh dear, oh dear. There's a lot of wild gesticulation and very animated expressions, and people looking at me pleadingly. It's very difficult to hear what is being said. I was trying to listen to the erudition of the Minister, but there's too much noise. Let's hear the fella. Minister. Speaker, the right honourable gentleman knows that he and his party have voted against this government's budgets, even though they have been reducing tax upon the lowest paid in every part of the United Kingdom. He knows, he knows that the budget set by the SNP in the Scottish Parliament last week have led to Scots being more highly taxed than people in any other part of the United Kingdom, and that, that in a year when the Scottish Government's block grant as a result of the Chancellor's budget decisions was increased by £950 million. The SNP, Mr Speaker, has squandered that union dividend. The message that we get from them is that if you have an SNP Government, Scottish people pay more and get less. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. City of IC in Solihull has been a cornerstone of my community for over four decades. So, does my right of all friend share my dismay at a council procurement process which has seen 60% of its funding wiped out overnight? And will he join me in calling on Solihull Council to do everything to ensure the survival of my brilliant local citizens' advice? Yeah. I, I, I certainly. Um, understand, not least from my own constituency, of the valuable service that Citizens Advice provides in many different parts of the the country. Now, as my honourable friend knows, the funding available through the local government settlement is largely unring-fenced, and these are decisions that are a matter for elected local authorities to take at their discretion. But I am sure that the local authority in Solihull will have heard very clearly my honourable friend's concerns. Sue Bell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituent Rachel wrote to me saying, My husband can't live day to day without insulin. He's trying to build up a supply by putting in prescriptions early. But there are no limits how much he can order and keep, and we have no idea how bad this could get. I'm also worrying about my son, who has serious food intolerances. I lie awake at night worrying about it. 
As the Minister knows, 99.5% of insulin used in the UK is made in the EU, and that's the tip of the medicinal iceberg. The Home Secretary, Foreign Secretary and Leader of the House all said we need extra time. Yeah. When will the Government allow our constituents yeah. to sleep at night yeah. and announce the delay yeah. in Article 50? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, if there, there's concerns about a, a, a particular case, then the relevant Health Minister will be, be happy to discuss it with the Honourable Gentleman. But in his, his more general point about uh, supplies of insulin, as part of sensible contingency planning, my right honourable friend, the Health Secretary and his department, have been talking to the suppliers of insulin and other key medicines and treatments to ensure that supplies will remain available to patients who need them, whatever the outcome in the current Brexit negotiations. Merriman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Health and safety is strictly followed inside schools, but we expect our children to cross dangerous roads to get to the school gate. Will my right hon. Friend consider new minimum requirements and a funding pot to provide pedestrian crossings, signage and reductions in speed limits to ensure that our children are looked after and do not have to cross such dangerous roads in the future? And I, I completely understand the concerns that not just my right hon. My, my hon. Friend but many parents have about this issue. Now, of course, the a lot depends upon the location of an individual school and the circumstance of the roads in which that school stands. Um, but I am sure that a minister from the Department for Transport would be happy to meet my honourable friend to discuss these ideas further. You're right, Davis. Yeah. 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 Mr. Speaker, uh, this week is a Children's Mental Health Week, yeah, yeah. and there has been a massive deterioration in children's mental health, yeah, yeah. so that now one in seven children of a mental health disorder, much live linked to rising poverty. Mm. Yet there is a chronic uh, shortage of trained psychiatrists to treat these children, and we rely on the EU for one in seven trained psychiatrists and much of the primary research. So what is he going to do to avoid a further deterioration of the situation if we Brexit? And wouldn't he agree with me that parents who voted to leave didn't vote to leave their children in greater risk of mental disorder and deserve the final say to protect their future. Uh, if the Honourable Gentleman sought my advice, I would have provided it. He was doing extremely well, but he should have cut it off about 25 words earlier. Minister. Well, the, on, on his point about um, EU health, health workers, of course, with the end of freedom of movement, we will need to put new arrangements in, case, in place. And the uh, immigration bill now before this House provides the framework within which those more detailed arrangements can be made for the future. I do have to say to the honourable gentleman, of course, the health service in Wales is devolved and is a matter for the Welsh government and. Assembly, but NHS e, NHS England's long-term plan is going to see the largest expansion of mental health services in a generation. Mr. Kenneth Clark, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I listened very carefully to the quiet and earnest exchange between my right honourable friend, uh, the Chancellor of the Duchy, and the right honourable lady, the Shadow Foreign Secretary, on the subject of the arrangements for Brexit, and I. I have to say I formed the impression they were fi trying to find detailed points upon which they could disagree, and that if it was left to them, they would take about five minutes to agree <laughs> on a proposal which would take us smoothly through March the 29th into proper negotiations. So can I ask my right honourable friend if he, if he can arrange that on February the 14th, we finally have some indicative votes in this House so that the sensible majority can express their opinion we can leave smoothly and start proper negotiations based on a customs arrangement and some regulatory alignment in the transition period and stop being so dominated by Corbyn Easters and the European Research Group. Well, Mr, Mr. Speaker, um, I, I have to say that um, in the, the last couple of weeks, one of the things I, I have um, uh, been spending my time doing is talking to uh, honourable right honourable members from all parts of the House uh, about their views on the way forward in, in Brexit, including members of the, the Labour Party. And if the right honourable lady wants to come and see me as well, I'd be very happy to, to talk further to her. I just think it is, I just think it is a pity that the Leader of the Opposition waited a full fortnight before even opening discussions with the Government. Sir Paul Williams. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. People watching expect MPs to be working together at this time in the national interest. While, while the Prime Minister is away, 
chasing political fixes, he knows that this Brexit crisis could be resolved right here in this House because many members would support a deal that was then put to the public for their approval. Why? Why, Mr Speaker, why won't he offer this public final say when he knows that it would break the, de- the deadlock? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, I'm, and I, the, uh, the, honourable, the honourable member has been a completely open honourable champion of the, the second referendum. I, I, I respect that fact. He, he knows the concerns that the, the government has that actually this would lead to an erosion of public trust in our political process and, and that actually... And that actually it would be it would not settle the question um, because there would then be demand for whoever lost a second referendum to proceed to a third. But I have to say to the honourable member, he needs to persuade his own front bench because yeah. I find opposition to a second referendum is quite deep in both major parties in this house. Bring hands. Ica, I've just come from uh, speaking at the launch of a draft uh, EU UK free trade agreement. Uh, which lays out 300 pages of what such an agreement would look like uh, and invites governments and businesses to engage. But this depends on being outside of a customs union with the EU. Could my right honourable friend, notwithstanding the exchanges earlier on this very topic, recommit himself today to our manifesto commitment to be outside of a customs union with the EU in the future relationship? I mean, my, my, my right honourable friend perfectly properly made reference to the Conservative manifesto in 2017, but I could refer him also to many, many statements from this dispatch box and elsewhere by our right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, to the same effect. What I would say to him is that for the complex negotiations that would be needed to establish the detail of the future economic partnership between ourselves and the European Union, we need to have the implementation or transitional period that is specified in the withdrawal agreement. That is what businesses of all sizes in all sectors are asking us in this House to do. That is why the House should come together and support a deal. Thank Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Minister explain why councils like Bury, with less brownfield land available, cannot use the most recent independent ONS figures on household projections to determine local housing need, thus saving more of our precious green belt from development? Well, of course, there there have been new um, uh, tests of housing need recently introduced, and and those are designed to reflect the fact that under successive governments of all political parties, we as a country have been building far fewer new homes than our country, and particularly our younger generation, now need. uh, And I can say to the honourable gentleman, representing one part of the country with some of the fastest house-building rates anywhere in England. I think this is a social justice challenge that we have to face up to, but the national planning policy contains within it very strong tests to protect against inappropriate development in the Green Belt, and the Government will stand by that approach. Lucy Allen. Last week it was announced that emergency services and women and children's services are going to be moved from Telford's Princess Royal Hospital out of Borough. I have asked the Health Secretary to call in this decision for review because the needs and health outcomes of people in both Telford and Rekin have not been considered. Will my right honourable friend join me in urging the Health Secretary to review this decision and to listen to the concerns of people in Telford and Rekin? Uh, as, I, as I would expect, my honourable friend is a very strong advocate for the health needs of her local area. I understand that she met uh, the Secretary of State for Health yesterday, and I am sure he will be reflecting carefully on the case that she put to him then. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Minister, with fuel poverty on the rise, thanks to your government, it is important that everyone in need of cold weather payments receives them. My constituents, who live less than 10 miles away, which is the majority of my constituents from the weather station, receive these payments when temperatures are below zero. However, I have neighbouring constituents in my ward who live, who are based on a, a measurement from a weather station 20 miles away. So will the, Prime Minister, will the Minister act and end this postcode lottery for cold weather payments 
for the good people of Belsall, Coatbridge and Christen. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, uh, the Government is absolutely committed to ensuring that the most vulnerable people get the support when they need it most, and it is important, obviously, that people are able to keep their homes warm during any cold snaps, and the cold weather payments and winter fuel payment enable them to do that. I will ensure that the relevant Minister looks into the particular constituency issue that he has raised. Jack Brereton. On behalf of uh, my honourable friend, the member for Stafford, who has been in his constituency this morning, I wanted to thank Staffordshire Fire and Rescue and Staffordshire Police for their efforts in the horrific fire that occurred in Stafford this week. I also wanted to thank the local schools for the support being given to children who know the family. Will my right honourable friend join me expressing our condolences to the family and friends involved? Um, I don't believe there is any member of this House whose reaction to that ghastly news yesterday was other than horror and the most deeply felt sense of sympathy with the family uh, and with the friends of the, the children and parents involved. I mean, I think for any of us sort of thinking through what, what that family uh, has had to, to live through and must face living through in the future, I mean, it, must be, it, well, it strikes one, it must be almost unendurable. I would, I hope on behalf of the whole House, uh, join my honourable friend in paying tribute to the emergency services and let us not forget that for those who were called out to the scene, this would have been a traumatic experience, and also pay tribute to the local schools uh, whom he mentioned. The um, Fire and Rescue Service is going to be leading an investigation uh, into the causes of this tragedy, and obviously we will have to await the outcome of that before deciding whether any further lessons should be drawn. Jim McMahon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, my friend, the Honourable Member for Swansea East, uh, opened her heart uh, to share the story of her son, Martin, and the pain that she went through uh, when he died as a child. Uh, nine months ago, the Prime Minister committed to establishing Martin's Fund, a children's funeral fund that would mean that parents wouldn't have to go through the cost of burying their child. But yet, nine months on, there's been 3,000 families who have had to find the funding to bury their children because the government has not put the fund uh, in place. So, can I ask, when can we see the fund? And importantly, will the government commit to backdating the payment yeah, from the yeah, date that that yeah, announcement was yeah, yeah. made? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, as the Prime Minister said previously, it isn't right that grieving parents have to worry about how to meet the funeral costs. For a child, we've confirmed that parents will no longer have to meet the costs of burials or cremations and fees we waive by all local authorities and paid for instead by government. We have been working, as the, I think the hon. Gentleman acknowledged, on the most effective way to deliver the fund, because we need to make sure we get this right. But I take, I take his point about the need to step up the pace, and we will provide an update to Parliament on the implementation as soon as possible. And I will certainly, I will certainly be drawing his comments and the support he has from other members right across the House on a cross-party basis to the attention of ministers concerned. And Derek Thomas. I am proud to represent Penzance, which is the start of the rail link to London and elsewhere. Five years ago, since uh, five years since this track was cut off. By both coastal erosion and landslides, the planning application has finally gone in to create a resilient rail link for Devon and Cornwall. Yes. Will, the, will the right honourable friend assure my constituents and this House that adequate funds will be made available to avoid any further delay? Yes. Quite right. I, I, my um, honourable friend is absolutely right about the critical importance of this stretch of line, not just to, to South Devon, but to the whole of the South West, and particularly to people living in Cornwall. Um, I have been told by the Department for Transport that the first phase of work to protect the sea wall at Dawlish began in November last year with essential repairs to breakwaters. That is part of a £15 million wider investment to make the railway at Dawlish and Tynmouth more resilient to extreme weather. And 
Top quality engineers have been carrying out detailed ground investigations to develop a long term solution to protect the railway but also to minimise disruption for passengers. We're now talking to Network Rail about the long term plan. Hugh Grant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last year, my constituent whose cerebral palsy was awarded £55 per week in personal independence payment. She was then diagnosed as having fibromyalgia, an incurable and often severely debilitating condition. She was summoned for a reassessment, and the private profit driven company this government chooses to make those assessments decided that she's healthier with fibromyalgia than she was without and wow. stopped her benefit in its entirety, leaving her £2,900 per year worse off than she was before, literally punishing my constituent for being ill. Yeah, How does the government possibly hope to justify such a travesty of justice? Yeah. Yeah. Well, obviously, the, the Honourable Gentleman raises a particular constituency case, and I, I don't know the detail other than, than the extent to which he has just uh, relayed that to, to the House, but I will ask the Minister at the Department of Work and Pensions to talk to him to look into the details of this case in, great, uh, in, in greater depth. Sir Bernard Jenkin. Yeah. Uh, could my, can I point out to my right honourable friend that the House has already had some indicative votes, that the House didn't like the withdrawal agreement as it stands, would prefer not to leave without a withdrawal agreement at all, um, and the whole government voted to replace the backstop. So what progress are the discussions making, uh, which are being led by a remarkable alliance of my right honourable friend for Loughborough, and my honourable friend for North East Somerset, who are promoting what is known as the Malthouse Compromise, which would replace the backstop with a perfectly viable uh, scheme to secure an open border in Northern Ireland under all circumstances. What's holding it up? There's, uh, there's no uh, attempt to hold anything, anything up. I mean, the, the government is very determined that we need to make progress, not least because of the two-year deadline under Article 50, and the importance to our businesses of leaving the EU in an orderly manner with a withdrawal agreement. Um, but the, the group to which my right, my right honourable friend referred has been meeting with my right honourable friend, the Exit Secretary. Those talks continue. Thank you, Mr Speaker. ISS are private contractors who employ some of my constituents as porters and cleaners at Kingston Hospital, but they won't pay them sick pay. One was refused sick pay after suffering a stroke, and coercing people who are sick to come into a hospital risks infecting vulnerable patients. ISS have now threatened to break off negotiations with the GMB Trade Union if there is any political campaigning on this issue, including contacting MPs. Will he condemn ISS for undermining their workers' basic democratic right to contact their MP? And will he call on ISS to pay their workers fairly, including when they are sick? Yeah. There's, there's, there's two issues raised there. On the point about access to a a Member of Parliament, there is no excuse for any organisation or any individual to try to stop a constituent from approaching their Member of Parliament. And while it is a matter ultimately for you, Mr Speaker, I mean, there have been previous occasions where such attempts have been ruled as a, a, a contempt of, of Parliament. Um, so I hope that uh, message will go back. On the substantive point about the, the operation of the contracts, clearly the, the contract would have been let by the relevant part of the NHS, but the Health Secretary has indicated to me he is very willing to sit down with the Honourable Member and talk through the details of this. Mark Francois. Thank yeah, you very yeah, much, yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker. Following on from the excellent question from my Honourable Friend for Harwich and North Essex, can I remind the Chancellor of the Duchy that on the 29th of January the House passed the so-called Brady Amendment, 317 members were present and actively involved, as they all voted for it, including him and the whole of the government. The amendment said and requires the Northern Ireland backstop to be replaced with alternative arrangements to avoid a hard border. As the government voted for it, can he confirm that is still their policy? And if not, which bit of replaced was not clear? 
uh, the, the, the motion, of course, also said that, subject to those changes, that uh, those who voted for the motion would be willing to accept the withdrawal agreement. Um, the, uh, the talks are continuing with the, the so-called Malthouse group, but uh, my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, spelled out in Belfast yesterday how she intends to take forward the work following the vote for the uh, amendment uh, in the name of uh, our right honourable friend, the member for Altrincham and Sale West. Uh, Leila Moran. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, the premise for the Oxford to Cambridge Expressway has never been consulted on, yet this multi-billion pound, multi-lane highway is set to carve through the landscape between Oxford, Milton Keynes and Cambridge and affects millions. Now there is a consultation due to start on the route options later this year, but will today the Minister guarantee that there will also be a formal consultation on whether the expressway is the right thing to do at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Mr. Mr Speaker, the, I mean, the expressway is part of a strategic plan for the Oxford-Cambridge corridor, which is probably the best opportunity for economic growth, for innovation and job creation anywhere in Europe at the moment. And I say, like her, I speak as somebody who has a constituency, not just a government interest in this. Um, there will be a public consultation on route options later this year. There will then be a public consultation on the preferred route and communities will be able to comment on all aspects of the expressway during those consultations. Mr. Speaker, there can be no doubt that the people of Venezuela are really suffering. Forty of them were killed in recent protests, many more detained, and many are simply voting with their feet and leaving, those that can. What more can we do as a government to help these people, and does my right honourable friend agree with me that sanctions are still a valuable tool? Well, w what is happening in Venezuela is appalling. We have seen the suppression of democratic institutions and traditions, and we have seen three million people forced to leave their country and live as refugees. Um, we and our EU partners have been clear that we need to put pressure on those around Maduro. We need to keep that pressure up, and we are looking at what further steps we can take to ensure peace and democracy, including through possible sanctions. It would be a help if in this House we could speak with a united voice yeah. rather than have yeah. the Leader of the Opposition looking to Maduro's Venezuela as a role model for this country. Yeah. Um, his right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, is, uh, is on record as saying that she does not want a business as usual relationship with Russia. Could he then explain why, in the last year, the Conservative Party has trousered a million pounds in donations from individuals with strong links to the Kremlin, including a former Russian defence minister and the wife of President Putin's former finance minister? I think that uh, while, while party matters are not, not uh, a, actually a subject of government responsibility, I, mean, I can say, I can say to, the, to the honourable gentleman that all donations to the Conservative Party have been properly declared and accounted for with the Electoral Commission and accordance with the law. There are people of Russian origin who are United Kingdom citizens, who are as entitled as any other naturalised United Kingdom citizen to support and to donate to the political party of their choice. Oh, Master Thank you, Mr yeah. Speaker. Uh, for parents across East Renfrewshire, the safety of their children online is an absolute priority. So I very much welcome the announcements from the government this week in relation to more steps for social media companies. But can my right honourable friend confirm that the online harms white paper remains on track to be out on time, and that whatever happens with Brexit, this work stream will be a priority for this government. Yes, and I have actually talked to the Culture Secretary this week about the need to press ahead with uh, urgency on, on this task. Um, we have heard the calls for an internet regulator and a statutory duty of care, and we are seriously considering these options. And Our white paper will set out clear responsibilities on how those responsibilities should be met and what should happen if they are not. Jane. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Falklands veteran Rory McCormick met his Russian spouse six years ago. 
and she obtained a valid Article 10 EU residence card in Ireland. Now, he, his two children and his wife, who is lawfully resident in the UK under the Immigration Act 2014, are being refused private tenancy in Ipswich. Does the Deputy Prime Minister believe it is morally defensible for a British citizen and his family to be made homeless in his own country simply because the Home Office guidance wrongly rules out Article 10 cards issued outside the UK as valid, valid eligibility documents for letting agents? I mean, the, as, as the honourable gentleman will will appreciate, I'm, I'm not familiar in the way he is with the details of his constituency case, and I wasn't absolutely certain from the way he posed his question whether the, the problem is over the documentation alone or whether there is a more substantive problem behind that. But the immigration minister or the other relevant minister will happily talk to the honourable gentleman and try and get this sorted out. John Barron, does my right honourable friend uh, agree that Brexit provides provides us with the opportunity of introducing a controlled and fair immigration system that no longer discriminates against the rest of the world outside the EU, and that that system should be the least bureaucratic possible. Um, I, I agree with my honourable friend on, on both those points. I think it's important that uh, in the future we have a system that is, that is fair, that makes it easy for the brightest and best to, in the world to come and work and study here, um, but also you know, judges people not by the country they come from, but upon their, their skills they bring to this country and their commitment to this country. Finally, Sir Vincent Cable. The Minister will recall that my colleagues and I in the Coalition introduced the naming and shaming of companies which failed to pay the minimum wage. Uh, this practice has ceased since last summer, apparently because civil servants are tied up on Brexit duties. What does this tell us about the Government's newfound enthusiasm for labour rights, and when will these lists be published? Well, I, 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 would, I would have hoped that the uh, the right honourable gentleman would have acknowledged that the government has continued to take forward and strengthen further the policies on exactly. national living wage that uh, we we did work together on during the coalition days. Um, but I will look into I'll look into the point that he's made, discuss it with um, my uh, um, right honourable friend, the secretary of state for uh, for industry, and um, perhaps drop him a note to, to to say what we've concluded from that. Yeah.